Well, good morning and welcome to our first ever online guest service. An especially warm welcome if you're live streaming with us for the first time this morning. My name is Chris and I'm the pastor of our church, which means I'm one of the leaders of our church family. And I'm going to be with you all the way through this morning. Uh, This morning there'll be songs to sing along to at home if you want to. There'll be some uh, people from church leading us in prayer. There'll be a kid slot where we're learning a verse from the Bible together. And my son Lewis is going to read a section of the Bible to us. And then towards the end, I'll take a bit of time to explain those verses to us. If you're with us for the first time, feel free to just listen to everything that's going on. Or you can join in with whatever parts you'd like. At the end, our church meets on WhatsApp to chat after the meeting. If you want to say hi, you can either drop a comment at the bottom of the page or you can request to join our WhatsApp group by leaving us a message there. We're going to start with a song now. You can sing along if you want to or just listen. It's a song that reminds us of the wonderful awesomeness of our God. Behold our God. Let's sing together. start our morning. Uh, We're going to have some uh, news now just to let you know that our next episode for our miniature heroes, our group for under sevens, is online now on YouTube. There's a link to YouTube at the top of our website, uh, just here if you're on our website, uh, or you can Google Bethel Church Otley videos. 
make sure you put in Otley uh, or you get a strange church in America. Uh, these uh, The videos will appear on Facebook uh, later too. Also to mention Heroes, our group for 7 to 11s is running as normal at 11.45 after the live stream. If you're watching and you have children of that age who want to join in, please get in touch so we can add them. If you're watching on Catch Up, so to speak, then let us know and we can add them for next week. Uh, also to let you know about our building, the latest part of our planning permission for our new building on Westgate has come through and work on the building will start again shortly. We'll keep you posted uh, and keep posting about those things uh, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. So look there to find out a bit more. We're going to pray now. Prayer is talking to God. And we can ask God for things. We can thank God for things. We can say sorry to God for things. We can pray in our heads or we can pray out loud. And we believe that God hears and God answers our prayers. Richard and Sarah Hughes are going to lead us in prayer in a moment. Often when we pray, we bow our heads, we put our hands together and close our eyes. But it's not some sort of special holy position. It's just to get rid of any distractions so we can listen. At the end of prayer... Uh, we usually say amen. Again, it's not a magic word. It's just the Bible word for agreed or so be it. So if you agree with the prayers, you can say amen at the end or even in the middle if you're really feeling it. In practice, it means that the prayer is over, though. Richard and Sarah are going to lead us now in prayer. Shall we pray? Mark records that on the Sabbath, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Lord God, we thank you for Jesus and his amazing teaching. We also thank you for his mighty works, which demonstrated his compassion and his power. Power over evil, over illness and over creation itself. Like the people Mark speaks about, we confess that we too are astonished at his wisdom. And his goodness. Mark also records Jesus asking his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. Help us too, Lord, to confess that you are the Christ, God's promised Saviour, who came into the world not only to teach and to heal, but to save as well. Paul explains about Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God. By him all things were created. And he is also the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. We are also astonished, God, by this mystery and this miracle, that you came down to earth in Jesus, and died for us. We admit that we can do nothing to save ourselves from the consequences of our rebellion and our failure. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you loved us so much that you suffered for us. We ask you therefore to forgive us our recent failings and we ask for your strength to live lives more like those of Jesus, wise, compassionate and strong. Help us to love the world as you do, to love all people equally, to care for the weak, the disenfranchised, the lonely and the poor, to see the world through your eyes and to be generous towards others with our time, our money and our gifts. Thank you for all you give to us and help us to see those things as blessings to be used to further your kingdom and its purposes. We pray for those around the world who are suffering through war, famine, illness and injustice. We pray particularly for Syria, for the Yemen and Libya. In your mercy, bring those wars to an end and help all those working for peace in these situations. We pray also for Afghanistan and Ukraine and for an end to conflict and for long-term peace. We pray for those who are hungry, thinking of East Africa and the Gulf particularly where locusts eat food people need. We pray for those who cannot afford enough to eat or food where food supplies are short due to climate change and coronavirus. 
We pray also for the governments of the world as they struggle to cope with the effects of the virus. In your mercy, Lord, bring this crisis to an end and help all those working to protect people and find a vaccine. We particularly pray for those working in the medical service worldwide at this time, for strength and for help. Lord, we pray also for those who are facing injustice around the world. In many situations, people are persecuted, imprisoned and killed through the prejudice and hatred of others. We pray now for your kingdom to come on earth, for people to know the love and forgiveness of Jesus, which drives away hatred, fear and cruelty. Father, we pray for our country now. We pray for our government, that you'll give them wisdom and integrity. We pray that your church will be a source of hope and a light to those that are without hope. Help us to be bringers of your hope where we can. Dear Lord, please be with all those we love. We lay before you anyone that we know and are particularly concerned for at this time. Lord, may the grace of God be with them and with us now. Amen. Thanks, Richard and Sarah. Well, every month since September, the kids at our church have been trying to learn a verse from the Bible. And uh, we test it out on the last Sunday of the month for a prize. This month, we're looking at this verse. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. And each week, we've looked at a different part of that verse. We've already looked at what it meant to cast your cares on the Lord, giving him all our worries and concerns in prayer. We've already talked about what it means for God to sustain us, to keep us going. And this week, we're going to look at that last part. He will never let the righteous fall. Now, to get our heads around this, we're going to watch a 30-second video just to start with and see what we're talking about this morning. Now, though some of those were quite funny, weren't they? I especially like the cat that sort of grabs the, the little girl's leg. But uh, now, uh, God promises in our verse never to let his people fall. But have you ever fallen over like one of those peoples in that video? I know that I have, maybe not quite falling off a pier or anything like that. Uh, and thankfully nobody was filming it at the time. But is God promising that Christians will never fall over? That would be very weird uh, of a promise to make, wouldn't it? No, he's talking about a different kind of falling. He's talking about the kind of falling where we mess everything up with God. But again, we see Christians doing that, don't we? For myself, I know that I fail God so often. I let him down. I fall. There's a wonderful proverb, though, from the Bible that helps us here. Proverbs 24, verse 16. It says, a righteous person may fall seven times but he gets back up again. A righteous person may fall seven times, but he gets back up again. What God is saying is not that we'll live perfect lives and never mess up. What he's saying is that he'll never let us ultimately fall, that he'll help us pick ourselves back up again. He'll pick us up and help us to carry on. He'll never let us fall so bad that we don't get up again. And what a wonderful promise that is, because sadly, I know that I mess up all the time. And it's good to know that God is holding me safe and will never let me go. We're going to sing the words of that verse now to help us remember it. There are actions, but as always, they are optional. So it's over to our super smiley friends at Seeds Family Worship for our memory verse song. Psalm 5522. Cast your cares on the Lord. And he will sustain you, he will sustain you. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you, he will sustain you. And he will never, never, never let the righteous fall, let the righteous fall. 
No, he will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No. Cast your cares on the Lord. Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will sustain you. He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No, He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No. Psalm fifty-five twenty-two. Well, hopefully that will be going through your heads uh, this week. Lewis is going to bring us our reading now from Matthew chapter eleven, verses twenty-five to thirty. Matthew is an account of Jesus' life and is the first book of the New Testament, the second part of the Bible. The reading will appear on the screen, so you can follow along, but it's also on the right-hand side of the screen if you're on our website so you can refer to it later during the talk. So over to Lewis now. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and even healing them to the childlike. Yes, Father. You would do it this way. My father entrusted everything to me. No one dreaming waits for it except the father, no one who made the father except the son. And those whom the son chooses to do with him. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy, heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. I am humble and gentle at heart, and you find rest for your souls. My way is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Thanks, Lewis. So we're going to be looking at that verse uh, in a few moments' time, in those verses. And uh, we're going to sing a song now before we look at that. We like to have a mixture of old and new songs at our church. And this one was written in 1834 and is based on Psalm 103, which starts like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your infirmities, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So let's sing praise, the, uh, praise my soul, the King of heaven, before we look at that reading together.
but it's time to us to come to the passage together. We're going to look at that now. And in many ways, this part is the climax of our meeting, as we believe God speaks to us through the Bible, as I'll mention in the talk itself. We're going to look at that passage together, and the goal is to understand what God is saying to us personally and as a church through this passage, and then apply it to our lives. If it helps you to know, I've got three points that I'll put on the screen as we go along to help you follow along. Let's pray for God's help as we come to the Bible together. Father God, help us now as we come to your word. Father, help us to learn what you would have us know this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. What is Christianity all about? Now, this is a much more hotly debated topic than you'd think. There are four main theories, ideas in general circulation. If you're looking into Christianity this morning, think of which of these is the closest to what you might think. If you're already a believer, which one do you find yourself most tempted to go along with? There's different theories. The first one is pitchfork theory. That's the idea that Christianity is all about being nasty and intolerant to people. At its heart, Christianity is there to set people against each other, spread hate, and bring us back to the dark ages. Hateful God, hateful people. That's the pitch thought theory. Some people subscribe to the peace man uh, theory, uh, which in many ways is the opposite of the pitch thought theory. Christianity is there to help everyone to be nicer to one another, so we can all set up communes, wear sandals and hold hands uh, when not socially distancing. The third theory is a very popular one, pompous theory. Pompous theory states that Christianity is just a front for those people who want to look good themselves and look down on others. At its heart, Christianity is a hypocrisy, a show, an excuse for people to feel holier than thou. And then lastly, there are people who subscribe to political theory. What is Christianity? Control. It was a system set up by the powers that be to control the masses, or manipulated to make it serve the will of the people in power as part of a big conspiracy. I wonder whether any of those resonate with you. Is that what you think Christianity is all about, or maybe a combination of all of the above? Well, this morning I want to show you a fifth way. I'm going to sum it up using just three words, using the passage that we read before in Matthew's Gospel. The three words are revelation, relationship, and rest. What can I say? I'm a stickler for alliteration, but hopefully it will help you remember it. Revelation, relationship, and rest. And we're going to look at those three words and see what the Bible has to say as what is the heart of Christianity. So first of all, revelation. If you've got a passage there at the side of you, uh, just take a look at verses 25 and 26. That's the, the little numbers there. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. What I want you to do to help you understand these verses is I want you to imagine for a second that you wake up tomorrow morning in a big white room with no doors and no windows. There are other people with you in the room, but no one knows why you're there or how you got there. A debate starts. Someone starts up, I know why we're here. We've been abducted by aliens. They're grey with huge eyes and big heads and they want to do experiments on us and they're waiting for us and watching us outside. Nonsense, says another. There are aliens, but they're green with small eyes. Ridiculous, says another. There's no one outside this room. We're alone. There's zero evidence in here for anything going on outside this room. Balderdash, says another. This is the government. We've been kidnapped by the government and this is our holding cell. Outside this room are other cells with people who've been kidnapped. They're all crazy, says another. I've had a dream that outside this room is a world filled with unicorns and pixies. So that's what must be outside this room. Now the debate goes on and on and on. Why? Because they're all guessing. They're all inside the room. Some guesses might be more sensible than others, but nobody can be sure. What they need is someone from outside the room to come and tell them why they're there, to come and reveal to them what's outside the room. What they need is revelation from outside the room. And that's what Christians claim to have, information from outside the room, so to speak. 
Christianity is all about revelation. We believe that God has sent a message to our world. And we believe that message is the Bible. Now, we don't believe that the Bible dropped out of heaven, just sort of landed here. We don't believe it was dictated by an angel, like Islam claims for the Quran. Equally, though, we don't just believe that it was the product of human wisdom, like the Buddhist sutras. We believe that God inspired human writers to write it down, and he used their personalities and style in its writing, not to diminish it, but to enhance it. I love the way that the Bible's different parts have different styles, but just one big message, a message revealed to us by God. But not everybody likes this idea of revelation. Many of us prefer the idea of working things out for ourselves. We don't like the idea that someone else tells us what's true and what's not. I know when I'm watching quiz shows or TV shows or, or being in a pub quiz, I'm sometimes suspicious of the quiz master even. Yeah, I, I really thought Montreal was the capital of Canada. Are you sure that's right, quiz master? When I was at school, there were nine planets in the solar system. I'm so sure of myself that I doubt all of the truth claims. I think I get the final decision on what's true so I won't accept anything that my clever brain hasn't decided is right. And that's what we see here in these verses. This revelation is hidden from those who think themselves wise and clever. Not because it's actually hidden, as though the Bible's sort of hidden away somewhere, but because people who think themselves wise and clever won't accept it. I mean, have you ever had that conversation trying to explain something to someone when they think they already know. It's so frustrating, isn't it? Some people at home, I think, are looking at each other right now, uh, remembering conversations like that. But Christianity is about revealed truth. God revealing what is true to us. So Christianity is not just a belief in a vague God, but a God who has revealed himself to us in the pages of the Bible. He has told us what he is like. He has told us why we are in the room. And that's why as a church we put so much emphasis on looking at the Bible and what it says. That's why we're doing this now. I mean, who wants to hear my opinion on stuff? By myself, I just know nothing. I'm just another guy in the room. My job is to explain what that guy has said in here. So if you're looking into Christianity, the best place to start is with the Bible. Read it with a friend. Meet up, ask questions. Look at it for yourself. Don't just trust the opinions of others, because after all, they're just in the room as well. But what does the Bible then say about what life is all about? Why are are we in the room? Well, the answer is our second point. Relationship. Relationship. Have a look at verse 27. My father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the son except the father... And no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Bible's claim is that our ultimate purpose in life is a relationship with God, to know our Creator. And that makes a lot of sense of why relationships are such a big deal to us as human beings. The passage here points us to what the nature of that relationship we have created for is. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, a relationship with Jesus is a relationship with God. God the Father, it says here, has entrusted everything to his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus knows the Father perfectly and shows his Father perfectly. To know Jesus is to know both Jesus and his Father. And there are parallels in our relationships, aren't there? People are telling me all the time that my two sons are the spitting image of me. But this is something deeper, something fuller. To know Jesus, the Son, really is to know the Father. The Son, Jesus, reveals the Father fully. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know God, know Jesus. Jesus himself says the same thing. One of his disciples says to him, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus replies, Have I been with you all this time, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the image of the Father, 
the image of the invisible God. So this isn't a distanced relationship. To know Jesus is to know God. And the goal of Christianity is to know God, to enjoy a relationship with him as our loving Heavenly Father. Now, as Christians, we talk a lot about forgiveness, but forgiveness is a means to that end. What we want to do is know the living God, but our sin, our our rebellious nature inside us, our wrongdoing, gets in the way. It separates us from God. And that's why we talk about forgiveness so much. Forgiveness opens up the way for us to know God, to enjoy a real living relationship with God that starts now and lasts on for eternity. Again, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life, as the Bible speaks about it, is not just living forever. That could be a real bore, couldn't it? No, eternal life in the Bible is knowing the inexhaustible God forever. Something that will never get boring. What we now grasp by faith here on earth, one day we'll grasp by sight as we spend eternity with God. So to know God, to gain eternal life, we need to be forgiven. Because otherwise that sin gets in the way. So how does that happen? Well, the answer may well shock you. Let's look at our third and final point, rest. Have a look at verses 28 and 29. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give to you is light. Now you might have expected here Jesus to say something like, Redouble your efforts, try harder, do more. But the passage actually takes us in a completely different direction. In fact, almost the opposite direction. The way that we're forgiven has to do with rest, repose, maybe even relax. But I didn't want you to think about t-shirts saying Jesus says relax on them. What we see here really is two parts of the same thing. Jesus says, first of all, come to me. That's the first part, come to me. If we want to know forgiveness, that we might know God, we need to come to Jesus. If you want to come to the Father, we have to come through the Son, Jesus. Again, Jesus says in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, verse 6. Now, there's a negative side of that, but there's also a positive side. Let's think about the positive side for a second. The verse says that we can come to the Father. We can approach him. And the way to do that is to come to Jesus. So it's not first and foremost about some process or procedure. It's about a person. We come to a person, Jesus. The second part is we give up our struggle to make ourselves good enough for God. Yes, you heard me right there. We give up our struggle to make ourselves good enough for God. Basically, every religion in the world says this. Do this and you'll earn your way to heaven or nirvana or moksha or something along those lines. Here's some rules to follow. Try your best and God or Allah or the laws of karma will let you in. But Jesus completely flips this on its head. Jesus says, you give me your burdens and I will give you rest. You give me burdens, heavy things. The religious leaders in Jesus' day weighed people down with rule after rule, law after law. They even had laws about when you could wear false teeth and what days you could take a bath. They were weighed down with laws and they were weighed down with sin. Giving people rules, you see, doesn't change the person. It very rarely even changes their behaviour as we can see all around us at the moment with the rules handed down from the government. They were weighed down with sin and guilt, and all the religious leaders could do was give them new rules, new laws, which only made them feel more guilty for not keeping those new rules. They were weighed down, burdened by it all. 
the picture here is the is like a heavy black rucksack on our back, weighing us down and causing us to despair. And Jesus steps in and says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The burdens that he's talking about are not physical ones, they're spiritual ones. He's not offering help with our shopping bags, he's offering help for our burden of sin and guilt. So Jesus says we can get rid of this burden. How? By simply giving it to him. Not by working harder or trying harder or by some religious ceremony or sprinkling on some water, but by handing our burden to him, trusting him to deal with the burden of our sin and guilt. And the Bible's claim is that when we do that, when we trust Jesus to do that, he does. He takes our burden of sin. He takes the rucksack off us. He puts it on his own back and he dies with it on the cross. So far from being a religion of do this, Jesus teaches one of I've done that. What remains for us is to rest in that, to take that light yoke that Jesus offers. A yoke was a wooden contraption used to attach oxen together. They could weigh a ton, but Jesus says his yoke is light. Not that he makes no demands, but his demand is to rest in, to trust in what he has already done. Now, the big question for most people at that point is, does this mean then there are no rules for Christians? Is it just thou shalt chillax? Well, yes and no. There are no rule keeping, no rule keeping will earn you forgiveness. That's clear. Our forgiveness was won by Christ and is given to us as a free gift. That's what the Bible calls grace, a gift that we don't deserve. It's where we get our word gratis from. It means free. But yes, of course, there are rules for the Christian because there are rules to a relationship. And what we want is a relationship with God. Rules that allow us to enjoy that rest together. So I'm in a relationship with my wife and there are rules, some spoken, some unspoken. I'm not allowed to cheat on my wife. I'm not allowed to hit my wife. I'm not allowed to grow a beard. That's just one for us. She cannot make me go shoe shopping. But none of those rules make her my wife. Not one of those rules earn our relationship. They flow out of love for one another. Let me put it this way. I keep the rules with my wife for many, many, very, many, very different reasons from why I keep my rules with my boss. I kept the rules with my boss for a promotion. I keep the rules with my wife because I love her. They're not a burden, they're a joy, even if I moan about the beard thing from time to time. The goal is to please my wife, to enjoy a relationship that we already have, to rest in it, to repose in it, not to make it. So Christianity at the heart is not about rules, it's about rest. So it's not quite thou shalt chillax, but I hope you see that it's very different from what many people make it out to be, a religion of rules trying to earn our way to heaven. No, Jesus says, come to me with your burden, give it to me and I will give you rest. Put your trust in me, turn from that sin and give it to me. So can you see how that's different from all those theories that we had at the start? It's not about hating people. It's about knowing and loving God, which incidentally leads to loving others, not hating them. It's, about, it's not about being nice to people to get to heaven. The Bible says we can't earn our way to heaven. It's not about pretending to be better than we are. It's about being honest about our failures and seeking forgiveness. If it's about control, then it's the most rubbish invention ever. Who would create a religion to control people that says that salvation is a free gift, that we're not saved by what we do. What Christianity is about is those three words, revelation, relationship, and rest. But I can sum it up really in one word, Jesus. Jesus who reveals God in the pages of the Bible. Jesus who offers a relationship with God. Jesus who offers us rest, rest from our works, good or bad, and that free gift of salvation.
Christianity is all about Christ. I guess the clue is in the name, isn't it, really? But if you're looking into Christianity this morning, that's what I want you to leave with this morning. It's about Jesus. Find out about him. Why not do some digging for yourself? Why not ask whoever invited you if you could look at one of those accounts of Jesus' life in the Bible together? Or if you could meet up online or for real and ask them some questions? Or why not join us on another Sunday morning to find out a bit more? If you're already a believer, is Jesus at the centre of your faith? Are those three words still at the heart of your faith? Are you still trusting more in what God has said, or are you trusting more in what you feel? Is your faith a living relationship with God through Jesus, or has it become a list of rules that you follow? Are you resting in God and what he has done for you in Jesus, or are you wearing yourself out trying to earn his approval? an approval that you already have in Christ. Remember, the struggle is not work your way into his good books, but trust that Jesus has put you there by his death on the cross. So what is Christianity all about? Well, let's pray that God would give us clarity and thank him for not just leaving us guessing, but revealing himself to us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Father, thank you for the way that he reveals you to us, Father, thank you for the way that he offers us a relationship with you. And thank you for him dying on the cross that we can just rest in what he has done. Help us to find out more, to dig deeper into that this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we sing our last song in response to what we've heard. Our last song encourages us to come to God the Father through Jesus, his son, and give him all the glory and praise. So let's sing together to God be the glory.
way to end our meeting. Well, that's about it for our live stream part of our meeting. Thanks for being with us. Can I mention that next week we're going to have a one-off looking at what the Bible says about race. It's a hot topic at the moment and I thought it would be good for us to look at that together. Also, I'm going to make this whole service available online, uh, YouTube allowing this afternoon. So feel free to share it with anyone you know who wasn't able to make it this morning. As I said at the beginning, our church has a WhatsApp group where we chat after the meeting. If you want to join in and say hi, just uh, uh, send a comment at the bottom uh, of the page and I'll send you some details. Equally, you can say uh, hi um, uh, there or ask a question at the bottom and make a comment. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram to keep in touch. We usually have an over coffee question, uh, but today I thought it'd be great to just say hi and catch up a bit with how everyone's doing. So do say hi, especially if you haven't said hi in a while. Uh, grab a biscuit and uh, you'll have to provide that yourself, I'm afraid. But uh, say hi and thanks for watching. Thanks a lot.